<laughs> yes, you're gonna get you're gonna get blasted with my loud with my exactly. loud voice, yeah. Shasla. Yeah. <laughs> okay, 47 good. hours, okay. So, did you put your mic on? No? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, so today, as I said, I'm very bad with introductions. Today we have Eric Curiel, thank you for coming. And mm -hmm. I should advertise that Eric is giving another talk on Wednesday, same time, at 2. And tomorrow we'll have Bob Cook giving a talk as well. Mm -hmm. So today, Eric is going to talk about... <laughs> uh, a very long title. Thank you. So uh, I guess uh, two prefatory remarks before I begin the talk proper. One is the title. So the last time I, the last time I gave this talk, um, Bob uh, Wald was in the audience. And uh, Bo Bo Bob, was, Bob was one of my PhD advisors. And so uh, there's, I have this long running joke in which I, I don't know how, if y'all have ever met Bob or know him very well. He's incredibly equable. He is just, he's really, really hard to disturb. And one of, one of the proudest moments of my life was when I, I actually managed to make him enraged. And so uh, I, I keep on trying to recreate the experience, but it just, it never happens. And I forgot, and I forgot to remove it uh, for this talk. So um, that's the first prefatory remark. The second uh, prefatory remark, is, well, it's actually a question. How many people here have um, never seen a philosopher give a talk? Everyone seen a philosopher give a talk? Okay, good. Excellent. Because, yeah. uh, uh, I, I ask only because, um, again, the last time I gave this talk, it was to an audience um, of mostly mathematical physicists, most of whom had never seen a philosopher give a talk. And so I actually wrote up a few slides explaining what I think philosophers do and why, how philosophers and physicists should interact. But um, I can skip that because uh, y'all already have an idea about that. Although you do miss out on two really marvelous passages uh, quoting James Clark Maxwell, who's my hero. So you can ask me about that later if you want. Um, I guess I will say this before I start, because this, um, I think this is important actually, whether you've seen a philosopher give a talk or not. So in a field, such as black hole thermodynamics and semi-classical semi gravity more generally, where we have no empirical experience, we have no empirical evidence to test our theories. But to me, even more importantly and even worse, we have no empirical data to guide and constrain our theorizing. And we have not been, okay, I'm gonna have to go back and, uh, no I won't. I will just say, we have not been, tr we, uh, arguments are in, the, in this field are guided primarily by physicist intuitions. And that by itself is no bad thing, you know, per se. But in, in other fields of physics, that intuition has been honed by long experience with the, with the regime of the phenomena that they're theorizing about. There's, there's reason to trust a good physicist intuition because that intuition has been trained. In this field, the only training the, the physicist's intuition has received is from further theoretical argumentation. So I think in a field like this, where in the, in, in, we have no empirical experience that guides and constrains us, our physical intuition has not been trained by the world pushing back against us, and also the problems we're facing what does it mean to say that a black hole is a thermodynamical system, for instance? What does it mean to say that an area is an entropy, for instance? Uh, the, the really, really uh, subtle and technically sophisticated uh, conceptual issues are really become deeply intermingled and really uh, intertwined with, I think, very subtle philosophical questions of 
methodology and epistemology and even metaphysics properly construed. And so for me, in this kind of field, I actually don't see any clear line to be drawn between physics, between a technically competent uh, philosopher and a conceptually sophisticated physicist. So one of the reasons why I began this section uh, calling it an apology, I, I was using it in the, original, in the original ancient Greek sense of the term, a, le a legal defense, or, uh, is because, in, uh, harking back to, to, to Socrates' apology, the apologia, and I'm going, and so as Socrates played gadfly, infamously, to the Athenians and thereby got sentenced to death. A gadfly is, um, it, it's one of those really truly enormous um, insects that looks, like, um, a, that looks like a house fly about magnified about 10 times. And when they sting, it hurts like you know, a motherfucker. And so um, they, they sting horses. And so uh, so Socrates called himself, in the Apology, Socrates called himself a gadfly to, to, to the Athenians. That, and that he saw that as his role as what we today would call a philosopher. So I'm gonna play Socratic gadfly and hope that I do not get sentenced to death thereby. So I will be talking about, I'll very quickly review what we mean or may mean by information loss and the information loss paradox. It's a, it's a name that is used to refer to many different kinds of issues, as we'll see. Uh, just to, just, uh, I'll do this very quickly, just to focus in on exactly what version of the problem I'll be talking about today. Then I'll uh, discuss, I'll rehearse a very influential and I think really ingenious and beautiful argument due to Don Marolf uh, now goes by, generally by the name of, of uh, boundary unitarity, in which he argues that black hole evaporation should be understood as a fully unitary process. I will then push back against the argument by looking at some considerations having, uh, having to do with the ca um, causal structure that one might expect in an evaporating black hole space-time and suggest that this leads to a hidden assumption in Morolf's argument, which leads to a dilemma for anyone who wants to accept Morolf's uh, conclusion. And I personally find one horn of the dilemma to be really unpalatable. We'll see how, we'll, we'll see what you all think. So, I think in, since I didn't do that, I have plenty of time. So there are two notions in, in the general, in the kind of framework of quantum field theory and curved space time, quite generally speaking. And um, so I, I guess d just in the interest of, of fixing terminology, whenever I say quantum field theory on curved space time, I mean that framework in which one has a classical fixed uh, relativistic background or relativistic space time. And one considers quantum fields propagating on this background, but there's no back reaction, so to speak. Uh, we, don't, we don't couple the stress energy content of the quantum field to the classical geometry. We treat the quantum field as test matter. If, when I talk about, when I say, when I, uh, that I'll reserve the term semi-classical gravity for uh, when we do couple the, the stress energy content of the quantum field to the classical geometry by way of the semi-classical Einstein field equation. So, in quantum field theory and curved space time quite generally, or I should rather say at this point, actually I'm just talking about quantum field theory on say Minkowski space time, just ordinary flat footed QFT. We have a good idea of what it means, you know, uh, of what dynamical evolution means. Fix initial data on a Cauchy slice and you evolve that data forward using something like standard Schrodinger, Schrodinger unitary evolution. And of course, this is in quotation marks because this uh, is not always actually a mathematically well-defined object. But you know, in the standard model, you're just gonna squint your eyes and pretend and it all somehow magically works out even though it's a big mathematical mess. 
in general relativity, the notion of evolution we have is you fix initial data on a, on a Cauchy slice sigma, and you then evolve that initial data forward into the domain of dependence of the slice, governed by the Cauchy development that's induced by the three plus one decomposition of the Einstein field equation. Now, one might have thought, huh, did this just die? Ah, now there we go. One might have thought that the central issue of the information paradox, information laws paradox, might be standardly posed as something uh, like the following question. Are these two notions of evolution in an appropriate sense consistent with each other? And in fact, it's never posed that way uh, in large part because no one knows how to combine uh, three plus one Cauchy development in general relativity with Schrodinger evolution in quantum field theory. And the semi-classical Einstein field equation doesn't actually do the job since it deals only with the expectation value of the stress energy tensor. So we have to do th this, in my opinion, if, if we could have a formulation of the, of the information loss paradox that really focused on the two, se the two separate notions of evolution at play in trying to model the Hawking effect and make that really precise and clear, that I think would probably go, I, I suspect would go some way towards helping us really understand what, what the important issues are in addressing the paradox. Unfortunately, since we don't have that, what we rather have are four, I think, at least four questions that are commonly posed and that are not always clearly distinguished from each other in the literature, unfortunately. Um, and they don't have standard names. Well, I guess one of them has a standard name. But these are the, the page curve problem, I think, is a fairly standard name at this point. But the others don't really have names, so I, I just gave them names just for ease of reference. So the Hawking problem asks, is there a unitary scattering matrix from scry minus to scry plus? Um, by the way, so I, I, I was, I, I'm speaking at an institute of quantum physics. My training, I was originally trained as a classical relativist and in quantum field theory and curved space time. And the quantum field theory I learned was tuned to the setting of relativistic space times. So if I, um, I may use terminology or refer to ideas that, you know, that, that you know, quantum, phys quantum physicists don't have at their fingertips. Please feel free to stop me, interrupt me, ask questions if, uh, if you don't know what scry minus is or something like that. So I call this the Hawking problem because this is more or less what Hawking, him what Hawking the problem Hawking posed himself when he, uh, when he uh, performed his, the famous calculation in 1974, 1975, that got you know, black hole thermodynamics off the ground and, and running. And that led immediately to the information loss paradox. So the page curve problem can be, I think, fairly simply stated as, does the entropy of Hawking radiation decrease at late times during evaporation? The final state problem is Hawking radiation, i.e. the quantum state of the, of the ambient quantum field in a pure state after evaporation ends. And the recovery problem, can the information, whatever exactly that means, y'all, I think, suspect know better, know better than I do what information means here. You know, can the information encoded in a physical system be recovered after it enters a black hole, whether it was part of the initial collapse or whether someone threw it in later after collapse? Um, no, it's not, because the final state problem is, um, uh, is a, at least, it's a, I should rather say it's not necessarily equivalent to that. Well, let's say in a, in a, in a, in a toy universe that only exists uh, out of a black hole in evaporation. Mm -hmm. e um, even there, not necessarily, oh. because the pure, uh, the pure state in this context is pure state on a, Cauchy, uh, um, uh, on a slice. And it's... To the best of my knowledge, it has never been, it has never been proved. In fact, I don't, I don't even know of a technically precise statement to the effect that if you have a space-time that is globally hyperbolic 
and a quantum field in a state such that its restriction to every Cauchy slice is purer than the global state is pure. Um, so th uh, t as far as I know, that is an open problem. But I suspect it's probably very often true. I just have to turn it on and turn it off eventually. Okay, good. Okay, so they all have more or less vaguely to do with the idea of unitarity and uh, whether unitary evolution consistently holds in a QFT for an, uh, you know, an evaporating black hole spacetime. Um, the relations among them and even the meanings of them themselves, as I stated them quite loosely and imprecisely, it's all complicated by the fact that in scattering theory, especially, unitarity has two completely different meanings. One is conservation and probability, and one is evolution from pure states to pure states. And neither of those meanings straightforwardly relates to the standard definition of unitary for a self adjoint operator on a, on a Hilbert space. So there's just a, th this entire field is one big mess of, different, of many people asking different questions using very, very similar words. And I think the ambiguity comes out most clearly in the standard argument about the Hawking problem and it's relative to the final state problem. And we're, what we're gonna focus on for the purposes of this talk really will be some variant of the final state problem. And I'm out of curiosity, um, so I wasn't sure whether people would want me to do this before I moved on to the Merolf argument. Um, would it help if I actually uh, very quickly talked through the standard, the kind of standard flat-footed final state problem. Okay. Then, so here we have, <laughs> I think if I walk out of range, okay. Every time I walk over there, it stops working. It's not, it's not properly entangled. So, uh, so here we have um, a standard Penrose, di a, a Penrose diagram of what is normally uh, conceived of as the, uh, at least outside of, if you, if you come from a, a classical relativistic background, you unproblematically think of this as the causal structure of an evaporating black hole spacetime. If you come from a holography of background, then you might not. But at least for our purposes, just to, get, just to get the ball rolling and to get us all you know, kind of in the mood about what the standard formulation of the information loss paradox is, I'll go with this. So here we have um, at minus time like infinity, some, some ball of matter, a star, it begins to collapse in, uh, it begins to collapse in on itself. Uh, right, right here it passes through its Schwarzschild radius and the and an event horizon forms and it eventuates in a, in a space like singularity and uh, scry minus past null, inf uh, past null infinity is well behaved. Uh, sigma one, this, this space-like surface is, if you look at, unfortunately, uh, there's not a, uh, I really should, I'm really terrible at drawing diagrams, so I always crib mine from other places. And so I, I, need, I need to find a diagram that, that, has, the, that has a line right here. So imagine that, uh, that the event horizon is continued on in a dotted line up to scry plus, up to future null infinity. Everything, the, if you just forget everything above that line and consider everything below that line, sigma one is a Cauchy surface for that space time. But sigma one is clearly not a Cauchy surface for anything above that line because there are, you know, there are time like curves, like this one right there, that never, in, that never intersects the um, sigma one. So, Sigma two, which is another space-like surface emanating from space-like infinity, which uh, you know uh, go, goes to R, goes to r equals zero. So th this line is r equals zero. We're assuming something like spherical symmetry. This is quote unquote the evaporation point. I say quote unquote because no one has any idea what actually happens. Insofar as we even believe that black holes evaporate, insofar as we actually believe that Hawking radiation, the Hawking effect, is real in some sense. We expect the semi-classical treatment to break down you know, well before 
the black hole completely evaporates and quantum gravity effects should dominate, should begin to dominate. So, but I, just for ease of locution, I'll just continue to refer to this as the evaporation point. So sigma two is clearly not a Cauchy surface for any, anything to the past. There are all, there are all these time-like lines that you know, head, into the, head into the event horizon or hit the evaporation point and never intersect sigma two. So the, if we assume that the quantum state, that the quantum field begins in a pure state on sigma one, we ask ourselves, and you know, Hawking radiation is being emitted right outside the event horizon. Let's say it's a mass, a mass of scalar field and the iconal approximation is valid and all the, all the good stuff we always assume when talking about the Hawking effect. So we can assume that the Hawking modes are propagating along null geodesics. They're hugging the event horizon and shooting off to future null infinity. What is the, what is the state of the quantum field on sigma two? Well, according to Hawking's original calculation and various refinements and improvements and clarifications since then, there, if you take this picture seriously and the framework that is, that is built into this picture, it's very straightforward to show that the state on sigma two is just going to be what you would expect if you do something like Schrodinger evolve the, so you, you trace out, on, you take the state on sigma one, you trace out the stuff inside the event horizon, you get a mixed state out here, and you just evolve that forward, and you end up with a mixed state here. So this seems straightforwardly to be a case in which a pure state has evolved into a mixed state. So just to summarize, by Cauchy evolution, a pure state on sigma one develops into a mixed state on sigma two. By Schrodinger evolution, this can't happen. The root of the conflict lies in the pathology of the causal structure of the space time. Sigma one was a Cauchy slide, is a real, is a Cauchy surface for everything, for everything underneath here. It's technically a slice. Sigma two is not Sigma two can in fact at most know about the information encoded in the mixed state defined on sigma one by tracing out everything inside the horizon. Okay, good. very good, because the, um, th this lies, this, this exact issue is something that for some reason, a lot of physicists don't pay attention to. I, I, I spent a lot of my time, I spent years wondering why physicists, so many physicists get freaked out about loss of unitarity here. No, I don't. No, I, 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 I know, I, I know. No, I, I know, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. 
Uh, I, I'm just, get, just giving you a bit of, of autobiography here. I, I, spent, I spent so many years wondering why so many physicists got freaked out about loss of unitarity here when they didn't care about loss of unitarity in exactly right. what the situations you're talking about. Right. And so um, the, the best I've been able to reconstruct why people care so much about it here is twofold. So one is that, yeah, well, um, in the kinds of experimental situations you're talking about, if you, really, if you really deeply believe in quantum mechanics and you really deeply believe that everything at bottom is unitary, then there should be a fundamental description at, um, at, at some very, very deep level at which everything you're describing that is, you know, pure state goes to mixed state can be resolved. And you know, when, you take enough, when you take enough of the universe into account and you go down to a deep enough level, then everything really should be unitary even if we don't have access to, that, to, the, to those processes. That's one. The second is that no one, of course, knows what happens during measurements. No one, uh, no one, we, we don't know why Schrodinger, quote unquote, Schrodinger evolution seems to break down during measurements. Here we have, here, th this is not like that. Here we have a very well articulated mechanism in which everything seems to be taken into account. There's no measurement, at least in the standard, in the standard sense of, of quantum measurement. And yet, provably, you know, we, we can actually work out using the, using the dynamical equations of, of the theory itself that we, get, that we go from pure to mixed. And, it, and the, the dynamical mechanism is completely traceable to, this, to the causal pathology of this naked singularity. So I think it's a combination of the, of the idea that insofar as, as at bottom everything must be unitary. I'm not saying I buy that. This is just, I think, what a lot of physicists have in the back of their minds. And that here, as a, we have a, a well-articulated dynamical mechanism that we can actually calculate with that takes you from pure state to mixed state is what causes people to really freak out, I think. But I'm not sure. No, I, I, I find that very useful because, again, especially speaking to a group of people who, who work, I know, ver, very much in the field of quantum information, I feel um, a little trepidatious saying this, but I will anyway. At least in, um, in this literature, what people mean by information is almost never made clear. What you just said, I understood. That, that was very clear. It, it's almost never made clear what people actually mean by information here, and it's very, it's very frustrating because, I mean, again, I, I think... I think this is uh, in sympathy with what you, with what you just said, a, a technical remark. You don't need unitarity to preserve, you know, every, to, to preserve say, conservation, to, to have conservation and probability. If you have, you know, a normal symmetric operator, you still get, instead of a unitary operator, you still get conservation and probability. So you can, and that, w and, and that, and that can, in fact, take a pure state to a mixed state. So the, there are all kinds of reasons to be, I think, to be skeptical already that this points to a very, very deep problem. But, I, but given that such a large you know, body of the theoretical physics community working on this thinks of this as a very deep problem, I'm gonna, I'm, for the purposes of this talk at least, I'm gonna try and treat it that way.
I'd rather have a good discussion. Than yeah, because I really, I mean, we come from a similar background, mm -hmm. and I actually just like PhD from Google. Mm -hmm. And I come from, I worked the space that points at this diagram from many things around, which I was not quite sure. You're telling the standard story. And si si since you mentioned that, um, I, I now can't resist adding one more remark before I go on, which is that, so I, I, I actually am, I personally am very skeptical of this standard story. Be because, I mean, the se semi-classical gravity, it's an effective field theory. It, it, it's, an effect, it's an effective field theoretic framework. You lose unitarity in effective field theories all the time, and no one freaks out. And we, and we have a very good understanding of why we lose unitarity in effective field theories. I mean, it, it, it can happen for many reasons, but you know, a, g a generic one is that, well, you, you, you've integrated out a, bu a, bunch of the, a bunch of the UV degrees of freedom, and um, as, as your system be begins to approach the relevant energy scales, it kind of wants to probe that part of the Hilbert space that you've integrated out, it has nowhere to go, so unitarity fails. I see no reason why this is any, any, anything different. The semi-classical gra semi classical gravity, you've effectively, cor in this case, I think it's probably coarse graining is probably a better way of thinking about it. You've coarse grained out whatever micro degrees of uh, freedom the gra there are for quantum gravity. And it's well known that when you hook up a, quantum, a, a, norm, a normal quantum system to a coarse grained environment, you lose unitarity. So I personally, again, I, I think I, I, I think I have a lot of sympathy with it, what everyone is saying, but because mine is a minority voice in this community, I have to give talks like this where I try and argue with them on, you know, on their own terms that perhaps we shouldn't be taking this so seriously, which is where I'm going, by the way. Uh, so, okay, let's look at, let, let's look at Morolf's argument. So Merolf proposed a novel form of argument that's become really widely influential, especially in uh, holography communities, that black hole evaporation is fundamentally a unitary process. And it addresses, I think, some combination of the final state problem and the recovery problem, as I very loosely sketched them. And he's, to, to his credit, he's using unitary in a very precise sense. He really does mean you know, what you get when you exponentiate a self-adjoint operator. And it is related to the evolution of pure states to pure states. I think, I think it's really an ingenious and elegant argument. I think it really delivers insight on a number of issues, which is why I'm going to beat up on it. Because uh, it is such a good argument I, that I think it really brings out a lot of issues with, 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 really gr with, with great clarity. So I, I'm not beating up on it because I think it's a crappy argument. I'm going to take issue with it because I think it's a really good argument. 
But again, um, I think it, be it begs a fundamental question, and it does so, I think, in a really, um, and it does so in the same way that all holographic arguments for unitarity I know of do. And as I say, it brings out this problem with real clarity, and or if you like, from a different perspective, which is the one that I'll be taking by the end of the talk, it makes perspicuous some fundamental and otherwise, I think, hidden and very severe consequences of forcing unitarity at all costs. And so to prove my bona fides, since I'm, I'm going to be critiquing the argument, I'm actually gonna present you the argument using slides that um, Aaron Wall, who is a vigorous defender of this argument, um, used when he gave a talk a few years ago. And don't worry, I, I asked Aaron for permission to, to use his slides. And I'm not, this, this is not, you know, well, what, what was it Picasso said? Uh, mediocre artists borrow, great artists steal. I guess I'm a mediocre artist because I actually asked him if I could use these slides. So, and I also think that, that, that Aaron did a really wonderful job of presenting the heart of the argument without too much technical machinery and in a really physically clear and perspicuous way. So here's the setting. So th these are now Aaron slides. Uh, you can tell because there's a nice picture in them. So uh, we're going to assume we're in an asymptotically ADS space time, but we're not assuming anything like ADS CFT. That in fact is the goal. The argument is going to concern the set of all quantities that are measurable on the boundary at a given time t, and we're going to allow, in fact, uh, for, uh, this, uh, this slice of the boundary, we're going to allow it to have um, a, a, a small but non-trivial uh, temporal thickness, so we won't have to worry about technicalities about smearing operators to make them well-defined. And the claim now is basic principles of physics will now imply that the info that falls into a black hole remains accessible everywhere and always on the boundary. So axiom one, there is an algebra of operators on this little strip on the boundary. And by algebra of operators, I mean exactly what you think I should mean. It's, it's that's, that's Let's just go all the way and say it's a C star algebra. You know, it's, it's just as, as expansive and inclusive and well-behaved as it could possibly be. And this is a completely standard assumption in algebraic quantum field theory. Axiom two, the Hamiltonian is measurable at the boundary. This, come, this is an axiom that comes from general relativity, not from quantum field theory. So in other words, the, the Hamiltonian is an element of our algebra of observables. And this is, uh, because in any diffeomorphism invariant theory of gravity, not just GR, the total energy, the ADM energy on the boundary, is a pure boundary term. And the uh, you know, gauge symmetry implies that H equals zero locally, up to a total derivative that arises when this diffeomorphism vector, if you, use, if you calculate it using the Komar integral, doesn't vanish on the boundary, but when this uh, vector, the diffeomorphism vector field that you use to calculate the boundary term limits to a time translation, you get the ADM mass in the completely standard way. So there should be nothing problematic or questionable or suspect about this assumption. Axiom three, the Hamiltonian generates time translations on the boundary. This is claimed to come from standard quantum mechanics. Uh, well, H is a self joint operator. We, we have promoted the ADM mass to an operator that's in the algebra of observables. It's, in some sense of the word, provably self adjoint And it, we assume that it governs the time evolution of, of, um, of observables in the Heisenberg picture, say. And the justification, as Aaron says, and echoing Morolf, these rules are simply the definition of the Hamiltonian in QM, which always exists if there is a time translation symmetry acting on the complete Hilbert space. Now, I actually don't find this so far to be completely convincing, and I think Aaron and recognizes that there is a a possible weakness here, and so he adds this parenthetical remark to try and give further justification. 
The identification of this with the previous H is related to the exact equivalence of gravitational and inertial energy in GR. Since I think that that is an even more deeply problematic statement than this assumption, um, I, I don't think that this justification works. But actually, this is not my main problem with the argument. And for the sake of the argument, I'm going to assume that this actually is unproblematic. I'm just flagging it in case you want to talk about it later. But I, I think that there actually is a, a serious issue here about whether the generator of time translations on the boundary should really be, a, should really be identified with the ADM mass. So axioms one through three imply that the boundary involves unitarily. So if you know, script OT is a family of operators related by time translation symmetry on the boundary, then you can solve for one time in terms of the other times in the completely standard way. Anything that can be measured at T1 can also be measured at T2 because both H and script O T2 are in the algebra and the right-hand side is just a limit of sums and products. And so no information can be lost from the boundary unless it was never on the boundary. In other words, everything is, and but here by no information can be lost, he really means everything on the boundary evolves unitarily. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. You have to um, take the idea of measurement here with a grain of salt. Uh, he, I think it, um, if, if Aaron and Don were going to be more careful, I think that they, would, uh, that they would phrase everything in the language of expectation values and, uh, and, to, and the two-point correlation functions. And they would say that there's complete equality, you know, that, that there, there, there's an isomorphic mapping uh, between the values of the two-point correlation functions that, that isomorphic mapping is given by the unitary translation. I think they would say something like that. But so I, I think that this is one place where, especially to this kind of audience, Aaron's talk about measurement is too loose. So axiom four, there are other non-trivial operators in the algebra that can be excited to form a black hole. This actually seems pr fairly unproblematic if you're in an ADS space time, you know, um, and you have appropriate, say, reflecting boundary conditions, then you, know, you, you, you wiggle something on the boundary and stuff radiates into the interior. And if you wiggle it in the right way, then you can cause, you can create, you know, a, a, an, an infalling, you know, self-gravitating, self self-collapsing field of radiation, say, that will eventually collapse into a black hole. So this, does, this doesn't seem to be a very problematic assumption on its face, but it's worth spelling out exactly what it means in some detail. So let's say that we have this scalar field that lives on the bulk and, you know, and has the induced values on the boundary. And so the, the, the scalar field in particular, because it has induced values on the boundary, should live in our algebra of observables. We know how to solve for a field outside of any horizons in terms of integrals of boundary limiting values from the, from the bulk. And in fact, uh, this is essentially known as the sideways Cauchy problem. You put initial data on a time-like slide, on a time-like surface instead of a space-like or, or a chronal surface, and you quote unquote evolve the data sideways. And it is in fact subtle, but the, um, it's mathematically well under control. And so, all you need, and I think Aaron is exactly right, all you need are some non-trivial, is some non-trivial field, field operator other than vacuum symmetry generators on a small boundary interval. Because as I said, because of the way that ADS boundary conditions work, just really small perturbations on the boundary can really pile up in the interior. It's extremely easy to cause little, little packets of radiation on the boundary to propagate in and collapse and form a black hole in the interior. Information is not lost into the black hole, the conclusion. Excite fields at T1 to form the black hole. These fields carry you know, information to the inside, but at any later, but, be, but by unitarity on the boundary, 
at any later moment of time t2, t including up here to the future of the evaporation point, the information is still available in principle and can be measured, speaking loosely, by a complicated experiment. So just to summarize the assumptions, there exists an algebra of operators in the boundary, seems unproblematic. The Hamiltonian, the, AD, the Hamiltonian in the form of the ADM mass is in the algebra. H is a self energy operator and generates time translations of the boundary. And there exist non-trivial operators in the algebra that can be used to form a black hole. These really do seem, at least on the face of it, putting aside the one qualm I mentioned to be simple, straightforward, unproblematic assumptions. To give you a hint of where I'm going, so the nub of my problem with this argument is that it, Im it implicitly assumes that the interior of the space-time is causally well-behaved in a particular way. In particular, it assumes that all required actions of the boundary can propagate in a determinable way anywhere into the interior of the space-time that I want. That's, that is assumed here. In assuming that the sideways Cauchy problem is always, is always well posed, you are implicitly assuming that the interior of the space-time is causally well behaved in a actually rather strong sense. But the final state problem strongly suggests that this is exactly what is up for grabs. How can we, it doesn't seem legit to assume, to smuggle into your assumptions that the interior of the space time is causally well behaved when at least, on, uh, at least one way of posing and thinking about the issue, that's exactly what is at question. Because, it, well, it's, because the failure of unitarity in the, for, in the standard formulation of the problem can be directly and clearly traced to the causal pathology of the naked singularity of the evaporation point in the standard picture of black hole evaporation. So to make the claim precise, to make my, my qualm precise, I'm going to introduce a few causality conditions and a theorem by Martin Lesord. And I think this, show, this will show where in Morolf's argument very clearly the, the implicit assumption is made without justification. So um, if, you, if your eyes glaze over as soon as you start, as soon as you see some symbols like this about relativistic space times, don't worry, I'm about to show you some, some nice pictures, which of course I didn't generate, they're all cribbed. So a space time is distinguishing if whenever a point, it, whenever the chronological past of a point is equal to the chronological past of some other point, or the chronological future of a point is equal to the chronological future of another point, then they must be the same point. Loosely speaking, no two separate points can have the same chronological futures and pasts. The space-time distinguishes between the, the chronological futures and past of all points. A space-time is reflecting if, for all points, the chronological past, it, the chronological past of a given point is contained in the chronological past of another, if and only if, the chronological future of the second is contained in the chronological future of the first. And again, I'll show you a nice picture to, to make that clear. If so, it basically says that if you, if you flip, it's called reflecting, because if you flip the space-time upside down, so to speak, then it should preserve, it should preserve, um, the, it, it should preserve what, is, what is causally connectable and what is not. So here's a space-time which is um, distinguishing and causal. There are no closed causal curves. So th this, is, th this is Meisner's uh, two-dimensional um, version of top nut space-time. So, so down here, b below this curve, b b below the middle line, so th th this is a cylinder. The, uh, as you move forward, the light cones are tipping over and tipping over and tipping over until when you, when you reach here, this would be a closed null geodesic. 
but we've removed this little strip, including a point on the geodesic. And as you move forward, the light cones tip back up. So it's, pretty, it's easy to see that at points, P, at points P and point Q, they have the same causal future. But they do not have the same causal past because we've removed this little strip. So this, this space time is past distinguishing, but not future distinguishing and therefore not distinguishing at all. Here's a space time that is um, not reflecting. So that, whoops, that space time is reflecting. This space time is not. So I have to show you, I have to show you two points such that the chronological future of one is contained in the chronological future of the other but the chronological future, the chronological past of the other is not contained in the chronological past of the first. So let's look at points X, X and Y. The chronological future of X is in fact contained in the chronological future of Y because I can take a time-like curve from Y, sneak around the corner, hug the light cone as closely as I want and reach any point then in the future of X. But the chronological past of Y is not contained in the chronological past of X. Because the chronological past of X runs into this, this wedge that I've excised from space time. So this, this space time is not reflecting. And we call a space time causally continuous if it's both distinguishing and reflecting. That may not be completely perspicuous why it's called causal continuity. Um, this picture gives some idea. It's easy to show that in, in, a causally in a causally discontinuous space time, it has the property that generically speaking, the, uh, points, it, the causal discontinuity manifests itself in the fact that points that are very nearby to each other can have extremely different causal pasts in the sense that the volume of their past light cones changes discontinuously. That's why it's called causal continuity. And this theorem by Martin Lesord shows that under extremely weak conditions, which I think are, are really nice in capturing the idea that there's an evaporating black hole, the space time must be causally discontinuous. So give me a chronological space time with time-like asymptotic boundary as in Merolf's argument, where V is the, um, is the topology of a slice of a section of the, of the boundary. And we assume there's a non-trivial black hole region and event horizon. I'm not going to spell that out. I assume, you, I assume you all know what that means. But we also assume, and this is slightly technical, but I'll, um, I'll go back to an earlier diagram and, uh, and say exactly what it means. The boundary of the chronological past of scribe plus is contained in the closure of the chronological past of a complete cross section of scribe plus. In other words, the event horizon is contained in the past of a certain time, time slice of the boundary. This is supposed to capture the idea that the event horizon persists only up to a finite moment of retarded time. And I think it, I think it does that, in fact, really, really nicely. And I guess j just for the sake of intellectual honesty, I should say that this is actually a simplified, I've actually simplified the formulation of Martin's theorem, but uh, to really narrow in on, uh, for my purposes, but his original formulation of the theorem implies this statement, so no, no harm done. So if you look at, say, that, that slice right there of scribe plus, this is not a time-like boundary, but you still got, you still got the idea. And you take the chronological past, the closure of the chronological past of that slice of the future boundary, that will contain the event horizon. So that captures the idea, I think, really very nicely that the event horizon doesn't persist for all future time. So a space-time with a 
that has, in which there is a non-trivial boundary to the chronological, to the chronological past of future null infinity, such that the entirety of that boundary is contained in the closure of the past of a finite time point on future null infinity, which I think is a very nice geometrical characterization of a space time in which an event horizon vanishes at some, you know, at some finite point of time. It must be causally discontinuous. Did I actually say that? I'm not sure I actually said that. The, the conclusion of the theorem is, under these conditions, the space time is causally discontinuous. OK. So now recall this crucial step in Merolf's argument. Sideways Cauchy problem is subtle, but basically OK. Well, if the space time is causally discontinuous, the sideways Cauchy problem is not OK. It is not well posed. It is provably ill posed in a sense of Hadamard. So the sideways Cauchy problem is subtle, but basically OK, only assuming that the interior of the space time is causally well behaved. That is to say, assuming that the interior is not, for instance, causally discontinuous because a, back, a black hole has badly evaporated. So the boundary theory must capture the phenomena of the entire interior. Otherwise, there is a possibility that a black hole evaporates non-unitarily in a way that does not register on the boundary. Thus, in order for the boundary theory to capture the phenomena of the entire interior, there must be observables capable of affecting every region of the interior. Otherwise, information about what happens in that region is not necessarily recoverable at the boundary, but that is exactly what causal discontinuity calls into question. By the way, is, I realized um, it might not be clear where the, where the causal discontinuity in the space-time occurs. It's actually a failure of, um, of, re of reflectivity. It's a failure of, of reflection. If you look at a point on the horizon right here, its, cause, its chronological past is all of that, which is contained in the chronological past of all the points on Scribe Plus. But its chronological future is just goes up into the event horizon. And so its chronological the its chronological future is not contained in the chronological future of points on Scribe Plus. So there's a failure of reflectivity. That's why it's causally discontinuous. Now, one can't reject this by claiming that we need a full theory of quantum gravity to, exp uh, to know what happens around the evaporation region. Because Lassorde's uh, theorem shows, in fact, that the causal discontinuity occurs arbitrarily far from any neighborhood of the evaporation region. It occurs, the causal discontinuity occurs for every point in Scribe Plus to the future of, um, of, um, of the null geodesic that heads back and hits the null singularity, and for every single point on the event horizon. So the causal discontinuity is visible arbitrarily far away from the evaporation point from the evaporation region. In particular, it's discontinuous in regions asymptotically far away from the evaporation region in a way completely independent of the details of the geometry of the neighborhood of the evaporation region. So you can take, you can, you can uh, take as big a sphere as you want, wrap the sphere around the evaporation region, so to speak, so that no matter what your theory of quantum gravity is, and no matter what you think about black hole evaporation, outside that sphere, things look just as classical as you want. And the space-time will still be causally discontinuous. You can completely segregate all of the quantum gravity bizarreness, and the, sp the space-time is still causally discontinuous. So I have a conjecture, which is not, which is not well formed at all for various reasons, but I think it's wor still worth stating because I, um, the way that you sometimes make progress is by saying things that are really unclear and ill-formed and asking smart people like y'all to help, to help me figure out how to make it more precise and, and see if you can make some progress on it. But I think that there's some, some more precise statement of this idea should be, it should be true, that unitary evolution is impossible in a causally discontinuous space-time. It is, so it's not, for instance, true. I mean, 
some, you'll, sometimes hear, you'll sometimes hear arguments to the, uh, or claims that unitary evolution is impossible in a space time that's not globally hyperbolic. That's not true. Um, you can, in fact, under, speci under very special conditions, ha um, with very sp if you really fine tune data, fine tune initial data, and are very, very careful about how, how the global hyperbolicity manifests itself, you can, in fact, have unitary evolution in QFT, CST on a non globally hyperbolic space time. But I really think that causal discontinuity will screw things up. So there is, of course, a way around the problem that, that I've been pointing to, the problem I've been claiming that Morolf and everyone who likes Morolf's arguments has. One accepts the argument by noting that if an adequate underlying theory of quantum gravity is pervasively and promiscuously non-local, and I really mean pervasively and promiscuously, so that information characterizing any small region around the evaporation region can be at least in principle recovered from information characterizing any small region asymptotically far away, then there, will, then there can be no, at the you know, fundamental quantum gravity level, then there can be no true causal discontinuity. And this, I take it, is the pill that those who like the argument uh, really must swallow. And whether it's bitter or not is a matter of personal taste. And uh, it's, I think it's interesting to note that, in fact, exactly this kind of, of extreme pervasive non-locality is exactly what, in fact, people who like the, the so-called island calculations as a, way to, as a way to resolve the page time problem, the page curve problem, um, end up with. So I think that while for me, this is, a very this is a very bitter pill to swallow, what this is essentially saying, if this is correct, this is saying that in principle, if I could give a complete and fundamental, exhaustive quantum mechanical description of my fist at this moment, I could tell you exactly what's happening inside of Sagittarius A star right now in complete detail. I find that, hard to swallow. Um, and I, 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 fi I, I find it hard to swallow for three reasons. One, it's not clear to me how pervasively promiscuous non-locality at a fundamental quantum gravity level can efface, manifest causal discontinuity at the level of classical space-time geometry in, region, in regions where space-time can be arbitrarily small. Because remember, we're talking about you know, asymptotically far away from the evaporation point, things can look as Minkowskian as you like. And yet, the, globally, the space-time is still causally discontinuous. So how can space-times that are, where curvature is so small, how can that, how can quantum gravity effects save you in regions like that? And failure of unitarity for a theory of quantum gravity seems, seems to me a, a far less radical departure from well-established physics than a non-locality that has more or less every region of space-time encoding information about every other region of space-time, no matter whether to the past or future, no matter how distant. And, but most importantly, and this actually now harks back to the discussion uh, that, um, that we began er earlier in the, in the talk, this would be a profoundly radical conclusion to draw about a fundamental theory from what is at bottom only a semi-classical effective field theoretic description. So, thank you. Oh, I mean, I guess I, I, I guess I have one more thing to say. Now, again, when I've given this talk, when I gave this talk to an audience that was filled with people who love Morel's argument, and you know, they were, were gung-ho for it, and I, I, had, oh, I, got, I had really long arguments with Ted Jacobson about it, because Ted loves Morel's argument. Uh, one of the things that, that, that Ted especially was pushing on me was, well, you know, come on, in, pa in the past we had radical revolutions that gave up you know, all, all, kinds of beloved fun uh, all kinds of beloved physical principles that we thought were fundamental. And my response was, well, yeah, Ted, but you know, those were all driven, those revolutions were driven by empirical data that we could not otherwise explain by our best theory, and that empirical data guided us towards the, those radical revisions in our best you know, fundamental physics. That is exactly what is not happening here. So now I'm done. Thank you.
long that it is preserved. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't say that some other information is not lost. Mm -hmm. Yes. So g good. This is exactly what Ted was pushing me on, in fact, for, for, for quite a long time. And strictly speaking, the argument I presented to you is, um, is, has only the conclusion that, that, you, that you just said, that information on the boundary can never be lost. But both uh, Don himself and Ted himself have tried to turn this into an argument uh, for unit for unitarity in the bulk. And they, I claim it can't be done, at least on le without accepting that what really is going to do all the work is this you know, mythological theory of quantum gravity that we don't know anything about yet, but, but that, it seems, would have to be really pervasively non-local in, in order to do the job. So you're, up, you're absolutely right. As, pre as presented, the argument does not say everything is unitary, no information is ever lost anywhere. But if, it doesn't, it, but if it doesn't do that, then we didn't need this argument in the first place to tell us that, that evolution on the boundary is unitary because whoever, if you have a well-behaved boundary and if you have a globally hyperbolic boundary, then why would anyone have ever doubted that in the first place? And as I say, this was Don's explicit motivation for constructing this argument is he then immediately went on to say, and now I, I've shown you that everything, everything in unitary, in the bulk must be unitary. But I don't think he can make that further step. No, I've, I've not proved that hol I've not proved that holography is dead. Well, I mean, yeah, so I, I, I would say that, again, to my mind, I, I think people really deeply misconstrue their, um, the significance of the information loss problem. I don't think we should be trying to draw lessons about fundamental theory of quantum gravity from, the information, from any version of the information loss problem, precisely because this is all effective field theory. So I, I think that I, I, see, I see no contradiction whatsoever in saying that at, at, the, level, at, the, at the level of semi-classical gravity, the at the level of semi-classical holography, unitarity fails. Big deal. We, it, it, may, it may or may not be recoverable at a deeper level. That's, to me, that's an open question. Maybe a, a, maybe a really great successful theory of quantum gravity that will garner empirical support will turn out to be unitary. Maybe it won't. But that's, that, that's an open empirical question that I don't think can be resolved by uh, purely theoretical arguments about phenomena and regimes that we've never had any empirical access to. So this isn't from ADS CFT. This is um, just how QFT works in anti de Sitter space. Ah, okay. This is just all right. Okay. So all, all, what, what this is saying is that, um, yeah. Um, but but and but remember that, that this is not ADS CFT because here we really are thinking of the boundary as part of the space time, in effect, and we really are think in the sense that we can do things on the boundary that affect the bulk. So that we're, we're, we're not really thinking, so in ADS CFT, uh, people often talk about the CFT living on the boundary, but that's kind of metaphorical. The CFT lives in its own, in, in its own flat space time. And then there's an isomorphism between that flat space time and the boundary of the, of the, of AD, of the asymptotic the ADS space time. Here we really are thinking of someone living on the boundary 
you know, moving charges around, sending radiation into the bulk. And this axiom says they can always do that in such a way as to create a black hole in the interior. So then, so, so then uh, the non-locality comes in um, because if we want to say that uh, so let, let's say that um, Someone here sends in some radiation and creates a black hole. And uh, let's just, let's just do, forget about that side for the time being. And we're not going to worry about whether or not the black hole evaporates or not right now. And someone here, a little bit later, makes a little perturbation, sends in some radiation, and it passes through the event horizon of that black hole, and it creates a black hole inside of the original black hole. But this black hole evaporates not too, not, not, not too, late, a, not too late after that. This is not a very good diagram, but I'm hoping you can at least get the idea of, of, of what I'm talking about. And so the question is, can, in order for, if this black, if this black hole evaporates itself, then this region right here is not visible from anywhere in the boundary. But if everything is supposed to evolve unitarily, I, I, can't, I, can't, send any, I can't send any signals in. Yeah, because the, this, this guy has naked, this guy has evaporated in such a way that this singularity is now naked. But it's inside this bigger black hole. So well, th then I, I think I can just say, I think I can say very, very quickly without going into the, the involved diagram. The issue is that if in, causally, in a causally discontinuous space time, it's easy to find, it's easy, it's straightforward to find regions of the, of the interior that are not cause, that, that cannot be causally reached by null geodesics from the boundary. Exactly. And so that, so the only, so then the, the, the only way then you can say, ah, oh, but all the information is still on the boundary is if there's some highly, highly non-local um, correlations between points in the bulk and points in the boundary. There is this um, uh, area also, also you found information, you have like this spin mm -hmm. lattice, and you put around some imaginary boundary, a couple of them, and then you can compute entropy and all mm -hmm. of this. And now, indeed, uh, if you have a region, you can say that all information is on the bound for a typical mm -hmm. state, not for a random state, but mm -hmm. a typical state uh, with the local interaction. And now, before that, had a pure state before you put it, this imaginary boundary. Now you can say I'm just interested in correlations and mutual information of, of bound, around the uh, uh, imaginary of this boundary, then you have a mixed state, an entropy. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, the loss of information. Mm -hmm. However, you can indeed evaporate interior. I can cut below the boundary, I can cut all connections with all other spins, mm -hmm. take them out, nothing will change. Mm -hmm. it, it, information about um, the entire state wi within the region is really unbounded. So the fact that it evaporates doesn't change it. Mm -hmm. Whether you cut them or not cut them, the information. So that's kind of a two stories that are mm -hmm. tension. On one hand, I think um, cutting 
them forever, will, will not be any more uh, imaginary. Mm -hmm. before. But the Gatling itself does, didn't change the entropy of right. the region. Well, I, I no, I, I was going to say I understood the claim, but I wasn't sure what the question was. So yeah, I, I think that's because, yeah. Because when you cut out inside, you have lost all the space. Mm -hmm. But the information has been there before or mm -hmm. not, uh, after cutting it out. Yeah. But of course, it's not good because you cannot go back to mm -hmm. the whole chain of life. No, I, I, th I think that's a I think that's a really nice and very simple example that shows yeah that, that makes that point for, very nicely. So, yeah, I I agree. Thank you for...